We are talking once again with Ari Cohn. He is the president and founder of the Post-Prison Education Program. And Ari, uh, good to have you back. Good to talk with you again for our monthly conversation regarding issues uh, with you and your organization and issues within the Washington State Department of Corrections facilities. So, starting out this month, you have been furiously working for probably for months, but certainly in the last uh, week uh, regarding one of your students that is running into uh, serious issues at one of their DOC's facilities. Can you talk about that? Yeah, um, I, I actually have been in the office since about five o'clock this morning uh, in order to get a email out to Steve Sinclair, Secretary of the Department of Corrections, and Rob Herzog, who's Assistant Secretary of the Prisons Division, and others uh, in hopes of keeping staff at, at, at the DOC's Twin Rivers Unit in Monroe from actually, um, uh, for all I know, maybe even killing this guy or driving him to suicide. I'm, I'm actually con I'm extremely concerned for his safety, more so than at any time in the, the 16 years we've been doing this. So, um, uh, uh, about about 10 years ago, I was up at Monroe um, at an annual Black Prisoners Caucus Summit in the Washington State Reformatory. And, um, you know, the guys who are in BBC are super smart. Some of the people that I admire most in all the land, actually. And people like Anthony Wright, uh, Kamani Carter is at a different prison now, but um, the guys who founded Black Prisoners Caucus back in the day, Gerald Hankerson, who's been out and doing crazy good. And, um, and this particular event was about, um, was about education. And um, Anthony Wright, um, asked a young man at the time, uh, he was just a little more than 19, to speak. And so our, he's become our st a student of ours, and we've been working for him for 10 years. His name is Derek Gregory Martin Armstead, and Martin Armstead is hyphenated. And he got up in front of I mean, I remember it like yesterday. There was there were members of, of the King County Council there, members uh, of the Washington State Legislature, like Mary Helen Roberts is retired from the House of Representatives, but I, I distinctly remember she was there. Adam Klein's legislative aide was there. Larry Gossett was was there from King County Council, and lots of educators. And the and the theme that year was education. And Anthony had Derek get up, and this young kid spoke extemporaneously and just blew me away. I mean, I, I more so than anything I've heard from anybody in my entire 73 years of life, this kid who's no longer a kid, he's 29, young man, married, children, he and in, in still locked up. He just blew me away. He talked, he talked about his story, which, you know, so it, 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 and, it, you know, I came away thinking, I mean, I was instantly thinking this is every every man's story, every woman's story, every prisoner's story. If you're caught up in the criminal justice system, Derek's story that day just was just reminded me, you know, it's your you your father might have been there long enough to get your mother pregnant and then he's gone. Um, your mom is addicted uh, and dies early. There's no parenting, and you end up the family you find is a gang, and in Derek's case, it was the Crips in Compton, California, and uh, so, uh, and that lifestyle leads you to prison, and and so Derek and uh, at an early age ended up 
uh, looking at a 14-year uh, sentence. And he's now like a little more than 10 years into it. But he, that day, I was so blown away by what he he uh, said. I I um, I got a, a copy of, of of his talk, and 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 I and I told him. I said, you know, if the if the post prison education program is still functioning when you when you release you're going to be a student of ours. And, and if I haven't died of old age, I'll be, I'll be there for you. Right. And, and we'll support you in every way we can. And then a couple of years later, we were, you know, there was a, uh, you know, I think most people know that a, a, a DOC employee, Jamie Bendel was murdered in that same chapel in a horrendous circumstance. And I knew Jamie because she was the person that always sort of managed the chapel if you were doing an event in there. And then the chapel was closed for several years and there was even talk that it would be shut down and maybe destroyed after her death in there. And, and but they finally reopened it. And the first event that happened in that chapel was post-prison education program. And we took the president of Seattle University and a bunch of other people, students, board members, community members, and we did a presentation. And just on the chance that Derek might be there that day, I took a hard copy of that speech from a couple of years earlier. And um, and we got up and everybody gets situated and I'm looking out over about 80, 90 guys. And, uh, and there was Derek sitting with Anthony. And at a point, and he had no idea what was gonna do it, but I put him on the spot and I, I called him up and I asked him to do the talk again, and he did. And and everybody, like Sunberg, Sunberg, you know, is president of CLU, he just retired, but everybody was just blown away to tears by this talk. And uh, and anybody who wants it, send me an email, ari.cone at postprisonedu.org, and I'll send you the talk. And uh, so then, you know, I ship him a book every once in a while, and, you know, send him a JPay every once in a while. But it's just a matter at that point of him doing his time, and 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 then us hoping to be there when he releases, right? And so, um, in the last six months, there have been some amazing, amazing, amazing. Um, this decisions by the, the Washington State Supreme Court and Court of Appeals. And even recently, a week ago, tomorrow, last Friday, the Washington, the, the, the United States Supreme Court. And the first one that hit was a, a case called Houston Sconyers, which was a guy's last name, Houston Dash Sconyers. And it recognized, the Court of Appeals decision recognized the obvious that children aren't adults and their brains haven't developed it. It's 16 years old or 13 years old or, or 18 years old. Um, and so they shouldn't be treated and sentenced and prosecuted as adults. And that was Derek. And so he, based on that case, he was open for, um, for resentencing. And he he had a, he had written a brief uh, uh, and su submitted a pro se to the court in Spokane. And, um, um, and the court, and it had gotten some action, I guess is the, the, the vernacular way of talking about it. And the court was looking for uh, a motion in support of why he should be resentenced and how he should be resentenced. And so, um, he, he reached out to me and I didn't want him representing himself in the middle of COVID in a Zoom hearing of sorts, um, in a hearing that that had the potential of letting him come home four or five years early. So uh, we hired a lawyer to represent him at the hearing. And um, so that was, that, that was like really happy times. And, uh, but simultaneous to that, I mean, it, it's a certainty that he'll come home early, and I think within the next six months. But at the same time, the Department of Corrections 
you know, there's, there's just this, this, this really, I wrote Rob Herzog and Steve Sinclair this morning. And I said this, in, this I have met some of my closest friends um, through the Department of Corrections and people that I respect mightily, like Eldon Vale and Scott Frakes and the, the others who are currently still working at DOC. I'm not going to mention because they might get fired for being friends of mine, but, but it's, um, but there's also some really horrible people there. And um, one, one of them is a guy named George Gilbert. Um, and so I'm going to like digress a minute and tell you uh, uh, how I first encountered Gilbert. And then I'll come back to Derek's story with him and where we're at now. Um, you know, about, you know, uh, Dawn, um, who has run this program before and we're trying to get her back in to run it again so I can get out of here. And, um, and, you know, so she, Dawn, um, had a case and went to prison for five years. And then in 2007, um, and I'm not going to leave it without, she, you know, today she, works with reentry. She has her master's degree in social work and she's one of my favorite people on all of earth and extraordinary, a warrior and has been on your show before and, uh, with Joe Jenkins and, um, uh, but, but, you know, Don, Don's case, she was sentenced to five years. And then a comparable case came along in 2007 with a woman named Mary Jane Rivas and, she came from poverty. And so she ended up with 15 years. So it was kind of like if you can afford a good lawyer and you're and and, and you come from a, 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 a you have family support. Um, then the appropriate set, you'll get maybe the appropriate sentence. But when Mary Jane came along with no family support, no money and had to deal on public defender, she ended up with 15 years. And that always bothered me. And um, and so in, in 2015, I had found out more about that case, uh, about what happened with Mary Jane Rivas. And, um, and the, and it was just wrong. I mean, so, so she, she went to prison as an addict, there was court ordered, um, treatment. And she got to the women's prison that used to be out at Medical Lake. It's called Pine Lodge. And she should have been in the, by court order, she should have been in the therapeutic community. But what happened was uh, a contractor providing, teaching, supposedly teaching these classes, uh, sexually assaulted a female prisoner. Uh, I don't know if it went to the level of rape, but it was a such serious enough assault that the Department of Corrections walked this contractor off the grounds and out of the prison. And then for budgetary reasons, um, they didn't replace the contractor. So, so Mary Jane went in as an addict and she came out exactly the way she went in as an untreated addict. And within a few days, she was involved in a vehicular homicide and a father of two died. And so this, the assault against the prisoner at Pine Lodge, uh, in those kind of things inflame me. I don't know any other way to put it. And, uh, and her sentence being lengthy and her poverty. So I, in 2015, I was, bothered enough by it that I sent a lawyer out there to Purdy to interview her, to talk about clemency. And, um, when the lawyer got out, uh, the, and I've got a, uh, I'm going to put this up on, on our Facebook today, but I've got a, a, a memo to file from the lawyer that was written on May 21st, 2015, when she got out there, um, she, she said, Mary Jane told me about sexual contact she had with DOC investigator, George Gilbert. 
So she got out there. We sent her out there to talk about clemency, but Mary Jane wanted to be talked up, wanted only to talk about these sexual assaults from George Gilbert, who, you know, DOC has this department. It's called I, it's basically INI. So it's investigations. And as I understand it, uh, in 2015, as an investigator at the Washington Correction Center for Women, he was also in charge of the PREA issues. And, and so that's the, that's a federal law prison. Um, it's prevention of rape uh, in prison is what PREA stands for. And so, um, and here he was forcing sex on a female prisoner. And I'm going to, and, and so I'm, I'm just going to read a, a couple paragraphs out of this thing to you. So like, um, she described in an office with George Gilbert that had a desk where he sat. She said the office window was along a wall and faced the main room where other people were. She may have said it was the day room. This is the lawyer writing. There was a chair placed with its back up against this wall slash window so that if a person sat in the chair, the person's back would be to the other room. She said that George Gilbert would have her sit in his chair facing his desk and then would ask her to reveal parts of her body and underclothing. She described Mr. Gilbert asking her to remove her panties so he could see. Um, in, in the next paragraph, she described encounters with George Gilbert in what she called B building. She said this building had rooms with desks in them. She thinks the investigators would sometimes interview people in those rooms. George Gilbert would call Mary Jane into one of the rooms alone. She said he would usually do this at shift change times. Sometimes she was asked to bend over the desk. She was fondled and touched sexually. She said George Gilbert inserted his fingers inside her. Um, and so, so that's the kind of person this guy is. And uh, I think what happened, there was a pre investigation after this came to light and Gilbert was transferred away from Purdy. I mean, frankly, um, I mean, it, it, it seems to me DOC has this practice. If you, if one of their employees does something egregiously wrong, they'll like pull them into headquarters, circle the wagons and protect them. Um, if we weren't on radio, I would be really crude about it, but it's, it's like, um, uh, I mean, you could, you could catch an employee having sex with a three-year-old and have a YouTube of it. And somehow it seems like uh, that employee would be protected by the union and headquarters. And so, so they pulled, pulled Gilbert out of, um, and out of um, not that that's ever happened to, to my knowledge. And I'm like to say, I'm certain that it hasn't, but just as a hyperbole to make my point, uh, they pull him out of there. I think he went into headquarters and, and, and then, and now he's landed up at Monroe and he's chief of investigations over the five prisons up there. So going back to, to Derek, uh, just when this good news from the court is, is happening, um, Gilbert pulls Derek in and, uh, and let me respond to this, uh, uh chat real quick hold on we live in webex land uh uh and uh, um and so and, and this is what doc will do i mean they'll like they'll, they'll so, so, this is routine what i'm going to describe to you so they they asked derek gilbert asked derek to identify people that were bringing drugs into the prisons. And uh, because I'm going to tell you, and I've written to Sinclair about this, and I've written to Herzog about it, and, and, and they're going to do nothing about it, but the prisons are awash in drugs. You, it's, 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 I don't care what you, if you're a prisoner, I don't care what drug you want, it's available, and it's available nearby and quick and cheap, and you can stay high your whole sentence. It, the prisons are awash in drugs. And the, the point I'd like to make with this is, is like COVID has ca caused, there's no visits. So the DOC excuse in the past has been prisoners are, are getting drugs in, the, their family members are coming through the visit room and all of this stuff. Um, 
that's not happened. There's no visit rooms now. Since last year, there's no visit rooms. So if there's drugs in the prisons, it's DOC employees bringing the drugs in. That's an unequivocal, irrefutable fact, right? And so Derek refused to give up anybody because he couldn't give up anybody because prisoners aren't bringing drugs into the prisons. It's DOC employees bringing the drugs in. And so the way Gilbert played it was he told members of the Crip gang who are up in the Washington State Reformatory that Derek had ratted them out as being the source for some of the drugs. So then, so, so Derek's life was in danger. And, and that's just, that's the way Gilbert plays. And I think other DOC staff plays, you know, they, they try to intimidate, put people in, 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 in compromised positions to, to, to get them to do what they want or, 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 you know, whether it's legal, illegal, whatever. And so once, once Gilbert put out to the members of the Crip gang who are active, then there wasn't safe for Derek to be there. So they, he ended up moved over to the Twin Rivers unit, which is, uh, in a, an adjacent prison and, um, at Monroe and, um, and then Gilbert, I mean, nobody knows what his ulterior motives were other than Gilbert, but last September, Derek got confronted with all kinds of, of false infractions. I mean, just, they were fake infractions for things that he hadn't done. And some of them were major infractions that could have jeopardized his resentencing, could have, um, could have put him in the hole for a, an extended amount of time. Uh, and we hired Braden Pence. Um, I, I called some friends who were lawyers at Snohomish County Public Defenders and Kelly Canary recommended Braden Pence. And we, and actually we tried to hire Braden and he wouldn't let us pay him. He got, he did it for free and he got involved. And the, and the, these fake infractions the major infractions were reduced to minor or, 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 or canceled. And the minor infractions were either dismissed or stayed minor. And so Gilbert lost that battle last September. And then you had basically a rattlesnake sitting. I was talking to somebody at Microsoft about this this morning. You had basically a rattlesnake sitting in the grass waiting to strike, right? To get back because we got lawyers involved on behalf of Derek and, and, and he, and he won and, and Gilbert in his mind lost. Right. So then come forward to two months ago, and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, name this and it's a matter of record if, in, within the department of corrections. I think the ombuds office has information about it. Um, the PREA records are established. A, a prisoner who won't release until 2038, his last name is Ackerman. He was grooming a 25 year old gay young man uh, for rape. And there's an LGBTQ community in the Twin Rivers prison. And, and, and a, a, one of the members of that community came to Derek because he's known as, as helping people you know, if you're hungry, he'll he'll get you food, whatever. He, but he's he's supportive. He's a, he's a, he's just an incredibly wonderful person. So, um, the LGBTQ community came to Derek and asked him to intervene, and he did. And so he stopped the rape of this young kid. And then this guy Ackerman was transferred to another how another housing unit at, at Twin Rivers, and then he is like livid. And he, that he wasn't, that he was prevented from having sex with this 25 year old young man. Uh, and he starts and he goes to Gilbert, uh, to George Gilbert, the investigations and starts spinning yarns and telling lies just to get back at Derek for stopping the rape. And, uh, and then Gilbert's waiting for nothing more than that. So he takes everything that Ackerman says is truth and verbatim from the word of the mouth of God or whatever, and, and acts accordingly. And they start terrorizing Derek, um, to the point that like last night, uh, I was, I left the office late cause I was involved in a legislative meeting till seven 30 and, uh, 
and I was headed to Link, and my phone's going off the hook. And it was Derek. And he, 10, 10 DOC employees had come into the housing unit to his cell and basically arrested him and and took him to a room and 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 you ate him, piss tested him, right? And he he tested clean, no drugs. Derek does not use drugs. They're available. He doesn't sell them, he doesn't deal them, he doesn't use them. Um, and, uh, but they were trying to catch him and they piss tested him and he was clean. Then they made him strip naked, strip naked, um, and, and photographed his body head to toe, looking for new tattoos so that they could argue that he's become active in the Crips gang again. And then that probably would have the result of him not being able to be transferred to a camp. And he's now down to four years or less, or he would be transferred to a prison where gangs are active and his life would be in danger. Right. So, um, we, so, I, so, so that's, that's George Gilbert and, 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 you know, and Diaz. So this morning I sent an email to Sinclair, uh, I blind copied you, I think, uh, to Sinclair, Rob Herzog, uh, a deputy prison director, Mike Obenland, who used to be the superintendent at, at Monroe, the current superintendent over the Twin Rivers unit at Monroe, Eric Jackson, who's just allowing all this to happen. I mean, I, I, I can't even, I have no words for what Eric Jackson is allowing to happen. And, and copied Senator Claire Wilson because she seems to genuinely care about social justice and copied Representative Lauren Davis, who I think walks on water, um, and a, a number of members of the press. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and we've, we've, we're helping him get, uh, get established complaints with, with the Ombuds office. Um, and, and we'll see. I mean, we're so, but that's what's that's what's going on. And you know, the ironic thing was, another prisoner who's doing uh, doesn't get out till almost 2050 if he's alive. Then and had died of old age. He was really furious, uh, apparently, at Derek's counselor. Nothing to do with Derek, but uh, this guy was trying to break into the counselor's office earlier this week. And once again, Derek stopped it. He and some other prisoners got together and they stopped this prisoner from assaulting a Department of Corrections staff member. And, and the reward that George Gilbert and, the, and his cronies up there had for Derek is to like bust into a cell last night uh, and, uh, and piss test him and, and, and strip him and photograph him from head to toe completely naked and, and just and so on. He's been threatened with uh, early about a week ago, the system was showing 10 pending infractions. Those seem to have been disappeared since I wrote to DOC headquarters and got lawyers involved. But um, but the, the pressure is really on him. I'm worried about him being suicidal. I'm worried about his safety. And I'm flat out uh, looking for a lawyer that will take, t take George Gilbert down. I mean, I don't know. He should... It's a disgrace that the Department of Corrections employs Gilbert uh, and or people like him. So that's 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 my last week. Uh, his, that's just consumed, um, you know, working on getting, working with lawyers who are working on his appeal to get him resentenced and home to his wife and children, uh, protecting his safety in the prison, protecting him from retaliation by this this POS Ackerman. Um, and, and, and so on, um, and kind of, you know, s switching gears, um, completely from that, uh, um, another thing that came up, uh, in the last couple days is, um, and this is a complete switch of gears, but um, a woman that her name is uh, Dallas Acres, and she's a friend of mine, and uh, she's a former prisoner. And I sent her an email last year, and she didn't answer. And I was like, well, 
you know, like, what have I done to piss her off? Right. And, uh, and what, why would she not answer? And then all of a sudden her best friend wrote me about a, a week ago. Uh, in fact, you may have seen the post. She put a post on Facebook and, and let me know that Dallas is back in prison. Um, so this is a woman who came out of prison and, uh, got herself on her own into the university of Washington and blazed through the law societies and justice program so fast. It was like a rocket ship and so well that she was accepted into the university of Washington school of law. And then she, um, she, uh, um, You know, I was I was in a, a two Zoom meetings ago, legislative meetings ago. You know, they're they're like they last an hour and a half at a time, and they they seem to be every other night. It's incredible. And and uh, uh, so two Zoom meetings ago, I was asked to critique people's testimony in in legislative hearings, and so I was in a Zoom meeting doing that, and and a guy who works for yoga behind bars, um, the testimony he gave was about how unhelpful and horrendously bad community corrections officers are. Uh, and, and, and some are incredible and have become friends of mine that I admire and like and cherish, but others are worse than you want to imagine. And so, so, um, Anthony was talking about that problem. So if you're a former prisoner, you come out and you have a, a CCO community corrections officer, who's not helpful or worse than not helpful. How, what kind of a negative impact that can play. Right. And, and, um, and that just reminded me of Dallas. So what, what happened? Here's this woman that's doing, I mean, she's a Marine Corps veteran for crying out loud. Right. And, and she's uh, blazes through UW undergrad and super successful and gets into the law school and she's just doing everything right and spectacularly well. But the CCOs have to show up and they're, you know, when you see them, when they're like guns and these black vests they wear that have look like, like the Marine Corps special forces, like bullet things and grenades and all that, you know, when they show, when they, you know, to go to the, they kept going to the law school and they're supposedly verifying that she's actually, a, you know, in, in law school doing well. Uh, like, why not ask for her transcripts? Why not give her professor a phone call? Why not call the dean of the law school who's a supporter of hers and just ask? But they got to show up and intimidate and disrupt and be as counterproductive as, as, as they possibly could be. And, and Dallas finally got sick of it. And she, and she was on a dose of case. So she just told DOC, like, I want to use the F word, but it's like, F you, you know, take me back to prison. I'll finish my sentence, my dose of sentence. And then when I come out in August, you guys won't be involved in my life. So she volunteered to go back and she's back out at the prison. And so, so then I'm talking to her and, and prisoner email JPay, And, and she, and she told me, that she had applied to us in 2013. And I, I was, it was, it hurt me that I had never heard her name in 2013, that our staff um, didn't react to her application. And, um, uh, and so, and I was embarrassed hurt and embarrassed and, and because another reason, another problem that Dallas was having at UW was financial, you know, it's law school is frigging expensive. And so, so she had the, this, this horrible lack of support from the department of corrections CCOs, but she also had financial problems and she had, she, she applied to us and we had not responded positively. In fact, as best I can tell now, we didn't respond at all. So I went digging in our archives and I found her 2013 application. 
And you know, there's an app, and and I just I just and, and on the cover sheet for the application, there's like this. The, our staff has to answer questions about applications, so it's like leader for change question mark. Yes, three exclamation marks. She's at, at the applica application indicates to be a heck of a leader for change, you know. And then there's a special note that it was an extremely impressive application, all caps exclamation marks. And then so I like took the application and went into McKenna's office and sat down where it was a clean desk and spread it out and start. And, and there's a, and there's a, a, a part of her application was a Seattle times article about me stopping the revolving door to prison and us getting the $2.5 million C prey grant from Beth Anders's court, right. In 2013. And the minute, and I had written to all of our staff about, you know, being heartbroken that we failed her, really. Um, uh, and um, and um, but what, when, once I saw that newspaper article, then I knew exactly why, uh, and, and and it was not a shortcoming on our part. Um, when that article by Jonathan Martin came out in the Seattle Times, a woman uh, that I think you and I talked about who we had kicked out of the program. I mean, she just, she, she, uh, Elizabeth Ann Reed, R-E-I-D. Um, once we kicked her out of the program, she, um, she just sat back again, sort of like a George Gilbert, just a rattlesnake waiting for an opportunity to screw people up. And, and, uh, and when she saw that Jonathan Martin article saying we'd gotten a two and a half million dollar grant from the court, then she started writing everybody. And she was, I mean, she wrote, she wrote the court, she wrote the plaintiff's attorney, she wrote the, the CPRA, uh, the, the defense attorney for AT&T, she wrote King County Council, she wrote everybody she could think of, and, and, and everything she wrote was a, a lie, a blatant lie that was told maliciously to damage our nonprofit because, because we had kicked her out of the program. And I got to tell you, in 16 years, we've kicked maybe less than five people out of the program, and what she did was immoral and unethical and, and so far below our standards you know, we had no choice but to kick her out of the program, and I'm to this day, I'm glad we did. But what was happening when Dallas applied was we were defending ourselves uh, with against these lies from Elizabeth Ann Reed, and we, you know, and we, you know, we got so for the like six months we were up to our ears in lawyers, um, in law firms, and hearings before Judge Anderson's court, and audits and everything else disproving. Elizabeth Ann Reed's lies, and um, and so fi so finally, we sued her, and you know suing somebody who's a, 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 a I mean in the middle of that there was a forty eight hours uh, story about her, and it turned out she was a paid informant uh, who lied to the police in Wenatchee about the murder of a young eighteen year old. Uh, young woman and and you know what happened there this is the kind of person she is what happened there was uh um as a paid informant she had gotten out of some charges that were pending it's basically law enforcement says okay if you if you become a paid informant then we'll let you go on on whatever these charges are but then when this murder happened it was Mackenzie cowell you can google it and 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 um uh, when the murder happened, and then the police in Wenatchee couldn't solve the murder. So they started doing what police do. They put pressure on their informants. And it's kind of like, if you don't give us some information, we'll jam you up. And so not wanting to be jammed up, Lizzie Reed told the police department in Wenatchee that she knew of who did the murder. Uh, and she actually named somebody who was totally innocent. Uh, had nothing to do with the murder, and that was later proven, but she just told lies. Finally, the police department proved what she said was baloney, uh, and, um, and, uh, 
and then 48 hours, CBS got involved and they did a whole special on what she had done and, and, and the murder and, and, and all of that. Um, so we, we sued her and um, not looking for money. We just wanted her to admit the truth. And we ended up with a, a document that was, you know, she settled and the settlement that we agreed to was, was that, uh, that was that, uh, um, that she tell the truth and it, admit that everything she had said was a lie. And so she did that in a document that's filed with the Superior Court in, in, in town. And so you know, that situation got so bad because of her lies, which almost destroyed this program. And frankly, we're still financially weak because of the loss of that two and a half million dollars. I mean, that the two and a half million got reduced to a million. And then I got so sick and tired of Judge Andrus and the plaintiff's lawyer, um, that that I just I had I had a Fred Diamondstone basically file a motion to the court saying stick this money up your ass and and, and, and I hope that's not illegal. To, uh, so uh, and we just handed back the grant and moved on. But so when Dallas applied, I mean, so the consequence of what that uh, of what Elizabeth Reed did was was horrible and it hurt us for years and it hurt our ability to help people and reduce the number of people we could help. Uh, and in and, and Dallas's case, uh, it kept us from even responding. And I, I took her, I pulled like, the application she sent may be the most impressive application from anybody that we've ever received in our 16 year history. It's an absolute stunning application supported by references, uh, incredibly compelling personal statements and uh and she she initiated it 2013 she followed up on 2015 and we did nothing and 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 we did nothing because we were caught up in this mess caused by this despicable person elizabeth ann reed and so like i, I you know yesterday i sent before i figured the whole thing out and i saw that newspaper article that jonathan martin had written um and then realized what was going on at the time she applied. I I had sent a, an email through our sales force to, to everybody who works with African student services. And I just, I said, you know, I'm like heartbroken um, that, that we just totally failed. Um, and that, that, that this amazing application for this extraordinary person came in here and we didn't, did, and we did nothing. And then by the end of the day, eight, 10 hours later, you know, I had I had figured it out, and because I, I look back at the date of that article, and then and I and it was within one month of Elizabeth Reed doing what she did, and you know the other and it, it didn't just stop. It wasn't just Dallas that got jammed up. I mean, uh, she had written a, a beautiful letter of reference for uh, uh, somebody else, a, a prisoner who was locked up, who came to her and asked her to help with her application and her personal statement. Um, and I pulled that woman's application, uh, and it was a stunningly, it, it, just a compelling, and it, she was a mother of five and, and, and just a, an impressive application. And, 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 and again, we didn't respond. Uh, and so it's just like, and it just led up to, you know, we used to have this guy on our board of directors, Peter Heyman, and. I remember him walking into my office one day and I had a, a file maybe of applications this tall, you know, almost a foot tall where, where, where like people with, who were deserving of help um, and, a, and should have had us working for them ended up with us not working for them. And it was almost always because funders in inadequate funding. And, and, um, and so I started, we started this practice of like, if we had this compelling application we couldn't respond to, we would just look at the DOC's website periodically and almost invariably they end up back in prison. Sometimes they end up dead, right? Most, but often if, 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 if somebody's like addicted, suffering serious mental illness, dealing with comorbidity, um, and we don't respond, they end up back in prison. And so, and, and that's been like uh, uh, a common thread that's gone on for, for 
just friggin' years. I mean, it, so it's like, um, since the whole, so yesterday between the commotion, with, uh, the horror story with Derek and, and DOC letting this guy Gilbert just go crazy at the prison up there. Um, and, and then this, discovering what happened with Dallas's application, uh, it's been a it's been a trying couple of days so um and you, you know we'll see where it goes so i i sent this i sent some information on gilbert including this affidavit to uh, a, a a a woman who was a microsoft employee uh, who volunteers with us and she wrote me back uh and, and I'll tell you, look, I'll find her email. So it's like, um, uh, God, she's like, I've just read through everything. I cannot believe George Gilbert is still employed. Is there anything I can do to help get him fired? And I've given her a bunch of suggestions. <laughs> so, um, but that's, you know, that's, those are, Um, I don't even know that that's kind of what we work our way through here every day, day in and day out. And, and, uh, but the thing that's really the horrific right now, um, is this mess with Gilbert and Monroe and, 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 and Derek, uh, life being in jeopardy because they employ these People like George Gilbert. I don't. So I don't even know what to say. Um, how much time do we have left? Oh, uh, we've got uh, about ten minutes. Wow. So you've, in your emails, uh, have expressed that you're worried about um, Derek committing suicide. Is that, or at least you? use the term suicide do you mean him actually committing suicide on himself or him being what one calls suicided in um the prison both you know both i have i have not known i mean when gilbert told prisoners at the washington state reformatory that derek had ratted out prisoners as being the source of that that's that puts his life in, je in jeopardy but that that's that is literally that's how prosecutors play here out on the street. That's how DOC staff, some DOC staff play inside the prisons. It's just, um, it, it, I mean, I explained it. It's, it's just, it's literally, it's like they'll pull you in, investigations will pull you into an office and they'll, they're kind of like, um, I mean, it almost reminds me of like, uh, it does remind me, uh, a, a hundred years ago, when I was young and I was in the home, my hometown, uh, or I was in the county seat of my hometown, I was in Tavares, Florida at Perkins Pancake House having breakfast with some blueberry pancakes with some friends. And this guy walks up, up to me, and it turned out he was a DEA agent, right? And he had a bit of a pot belly, and, and he's got his sport coat open, so I'll see the guns there. And he knew me, he knew who I was. However, that, I mean, so out of the four or five people at the table, he called my name and looked at me and asked if I, if I would be willing to talk to him for a minute. And, and uh, I'm not often telling people with guns no. So I said, sure. So we go back to the back dining room um, and sit down and, and, and he he was at, the DEA was after my lawyer, our court, the, the the lawyer who did work with, uh, you know, corporate work for for our corporate for corporation and uh, and the, the you know the sum total of it was I mean he wanted me to wear he told me things about my friend this lawyer that I had no idea about and um, I mean Mike his name was Mike Norvell and he was he was actually buying really nice planes and leasing them uh, to, to big time mafia drug dealers. So, so they, they might lease a plane for 48 hours, fly to South America, loaded with cash, come back with, loaded with drugs. And uh, 
somehow, and, and they had been ignoring attorney client privilege and listening in on his calls and they knew what he was doing and they wanted me to wear a wire in there and they knew from monitoring his calls that Mike and I were friends and we were friends, um, if not best friends actually. And so, but the deal was they offered me money, money, money. They offered me car, money, income, just damn near. I probably could have, I, don't, I could have probably ask for, I don't know what they wanted this guy so bad and they would have, have granted. Well, DOC, you know, like George Gilbert operates the same way. It's like, you know, tell us who's bringing drugs into the prison and we'll make your life easy. You know, you, you know, we won't shake down your cell. Well, well, this, well, that you can, you know, you can, um, sell legal services or legal work for, for, for extra commissary and we won't take the excess away. You know, we, you know, you can shoot the Pope and we won't do anything about it. It's that's the way Gilbert plays. And then if you don't give them what they want, then they just go out and lie and jeopardize your life. And, and, and so, um, so w when you're under that kind of pressure, you know, I, I, I talking to Derek the other day, he was so despondent that it scared me. Uh, and, it, it, you know, my dad committed suicide on Father's Day in 1975, and it's like 40 plus years later, and I think about it every goddamn day. And uh, and so I'm tuned into that, and I was like, um, it, it, it really it worried me. And, um, uh, it, but then the other is what you just mentioned, you know, it's like being suicided. You know, uh, I was, when I was in prison, um, in the federal transfer center outside of Oklahoma City, uh, a, a federal bureau of prisons employee named Rodney D. Champlain, along with a couple of FBI agents, went into a guy's cell. And you, you know, I had his brother in at town hall a couple of years ago, so you know the story. And, and interrogating a guy that they thought was guilty of doing something that he had no knowledge of at all, they literally beat this guy to death with a fire extinguisher. You know, so they're um, and then try to say it was suicide. And then, you know, and then when the investigators, investigators go in there with aluminol and spray the floor and the ceiling and all that, it lights up like a purple Christmas tree and which is indicative that this is blood. So you, you committed suicide, right? There's blood on the ceiling, blood on the walls, blood in the floor. Like that's what one, one hell of a way to come. I mean, how did you do that? You know? Uh, so I, I, I worry about both and, and, and I just, I want to see him get out of Twin Rivers. I want to see Gilbert fired and prosecuted. Uh, and I'm going to do everything in my power to make that happen. Washington State just recently recreated a ombuds office for the Department of Corrections. Is that office of any help in dealing with issues like Gilbert? I, you, you know, yes, but I posted, uh, tell me how much time we've got and uh, so I can t tell you. Five minutes. Oh, good. So, so you, you know, the original, uh, uh, Dan Clark, a lawyer in Walla Walla is retired now. Uh, Adam Klein's legislative aide, Bryn Houghton and I, and Tim Bouts, who worked in the Washington State Penitentiary as a teacher for 30 plus years. And Kimberly May sat in a Mexican restaurant in, in Walla Walla in 2000 six uh, and wrote the original bill. It was a commission to, uh, that, that became the ombuds bill. So like I know that inside and out and we fought for it for years. And DOC opposed it and Republicans opposed it. And, um, and but then finally Disability Rights Washington got involved. Melody Simley never quit fighting uh, and the, the bill was passed, but, it, but when it came out of Roger Goodman's public safety committee, uh, a guy named Clippert, who's in the House of Representatives from Tri-Cities, ha had succeeded in keeping the ombuds from having the ability to sue. And so it's, it, they're effective, but they're, they're, they'll never be totally effective until they can sue. So... <laughs> what happens is um, is they uh, 
they investigate something like they're they're involved i've gotten them involved there's an investigation going on right now with what gilbert's been doing with uh derek what eric jackson has been allowing gilbert to do and so on uh and then there'll be a report uh and 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 the report will go to people who basically don't give a damn you know roger goodman cares about getting his paycheck he cares about having people kowtow to him, building his pension, being reelected. In the last analysis, that's what Roger cares about. And there's so many in the legislature that are just like that. So the reports from the ombuds, you know, they do an investigation, they file a report. The reports could be blazing. I mean, like some of the reports that come out, I'm surprised that Steve Sinclair can is is a, you know is is not ashamed to show his face in public. I, I mean, some of the reports that come out of the Ombuds office are horrifying, and they're true, but they just they they go to the Senate, they go to they go to Inslee, so they go to people, they go to the House of Representatives, they go to people that don't really and truly do not give a damn, and so and that and, and so then nothing happens, you know. You end up listening to uh, like Roger Goodman praise Sinclair about what a wonderful job he's doing. Like 6,000 plus prisoners have COVID-19, 15 are dead and, Sin and Sinclair's doing a wonderful job. I don't think so. You know, so it minus the ability to sue, um, which they really needed, uh, it's not near what it was necessary, but it's, they're still, this, uh, there's a couple people that work in the ombuds office that I, I just worship. I mean, and there's one that is just a, she, she's a hero of mine, and I'm not going to name her because I don't want her to get her fired. But I mean, uh, so it's like it's like yes and no. They need they needed the power to sue, um, you know, writing reports and giving them to people who don't give a damn, you know slight embarrassment or something who knows and and but it's just not the ability it's it's not you know like you know there was four guards at, at the washington state corrections at washington correction center for women in purdy that that but repeatedly sexually assaulted two women for years and and columbia legal services can sue and when beth colgan who's another hero of mine, was at Columbia Legal Services. She brought a lawsuit on behalf of these two women, and the DOC wrote a check for a million uh, for a million dollars. Didn't come out of their budget or anything like that. It came out of taxpayers. But the, but the, but but they sued. The prison, the this DOC staff members were identified. What they had done was is an accepted fact. Um, and, and so, so the ombuds needs to be able to do what Beth Colgan did. Um, you know, with that lawsuit. And, and by the way, anything I've mentioned today, anybody wants a copy of it, write me, re.conepostprisonedu.org. I'll, I'll email you the lawsuit that Columbia Legal Services brought against DOC. Uh, I'll email you this affidavit the lawyer wrote about her, uh, her meeting with Mary Jane Rivas. Uh, anything I've mentioned today, I'm more than happy to send out. Right. Uh, one minute left. Uh, you always have on intriguing shirts. <laughs> I figure we end on an upbeat note. What's today's uh, shirt? Uh, you know, I was so this is like I don't know if you can read it, but it's like I don't know if I can. University of Washington Fall Orientation 2003. And I, you know, when when thinking about Dallas Acres, uh, is what made me put this on uh, this morning. And uh, um, so I spent five years in federal prison and then I came out to the University of Washington. And so three years later, uh, they, they picked the, they picked, I don't know whether you say the best and the brightest or the ones with the best grades or whatever, but they picked the top students in the school to lead the orientation of the incoming freshman class. And, 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 you know, the last two and a half years I spent in prison, I was in the hall. Uh, and, uh, and so to come out of federal prison, come out of two and a half years in the hall, um, and go to the University of Washington and, uh, just, uh, I can't even describe it. You know, it has a lot to do with why this program exists and why we do what we do, but I just, 
one of the one of the really I mean I had four honor societies and three eight two GPA and um and went straight from UW to the Washington State Senate, which was interesting. And but but in 2003, the year before I graduated, I was picked as one of the people to work with the incoming 6,000 new freshmen. Uh, and and you know you walked them around the campus. You said this is this building. This is what happens here. And you had boxes and boxes of pizzas you could hand out. And 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 and, he, and here this is the libraries and. You know, if you're an electrical engineer, there's your building and and answer questions and and but it was just an incredible honor for somebody uh, who, who literally three years earlier was sitting in a high security federal prison in Minersville, Pennsylvania, and right before that had been in a disciplinary prison up in the Adirondacks. So that's what this shirt is. And I just, I just, I just thinking about Dallas and she'll come out in August and she'll go back to the law school. Uh, and then she'll be a, a, a leader for change and a game changer. All uh, right. So that's why I put it on. Well, we're going to have to uh, end it there, but luckily there is next month when. Yeah. I'm still going to try to get somebody on here other than me. <laughs> Maybe I will have died of old age and retired. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> oh, no. None of that. All right. All right.